you begin by observing. You have to look. You have to see. had a very pleasant, ordinary childhood. But of course I would say that. Anyway. No, I did. Uh, my brother and I were raised by a single parent, our mom, who was, we were latchkey kids before there were latchkey kids. And we grew up out in the country and we had the usual friends and uh, my brother and I were both readers. And at some point along the way, I decided that uh, I wanted to be a writer. So I started to type up stories on an old typewriter that I had and, uh, and I started to send them to magazines and I pounded a, a, a nail into the wall and I'd get the rejection slips back and I would put them on that nail and around the time that I turned 17 or 18, uh, the nail fell out of the wall because there were so many rejection slips on it, so I got a bigger nail. And uh, if there's any, any secret that I know to success, it's uh, <laughs> if you don't succeed, get a bigger nail. So that's what I did and it worked out. And uh, eventually I started to sell a bunch of short stories to magazines that don't exist anymore because uh, you can get all that stuff on the internet now. But there were these magazines called Dude and Gent and Cavalier and Adam and Knight. And they were the sort of magazines, if you turn them sideways, a gatefold fell out of them. But they paid actual money. And uh, I was working first in a, uh, a laundry and then I got a job teaching school for the princely sum of $6,400 a year. And I had a wonderful idea for a book when I was teaching school. And it was February vacation. I had one week, and I wrote this novel in one week because one week was what I had. And uh, I decided that I would call it The Running Man. And uh, I sent it off to uh, a science fiction publisher um, who did paperback originals and actually got back a note that said, there is no market for dystopian fantasies. And I thought about that a couple of years ago when The Hunger Games and all these other books came up. And I thought, bullsh**, there's no market for dystopian fantasies. I was ahead of my time with that. So it was eventually published uh, under the name Richard Bachman along with some other books. So. It all worked out eventually, and I did sell my first novel, uh, Carrie, and uh, the advance was $2,500, which came in very handy because we had a very old car, my wife and I, and uh, we were able to trade it for a Ford Pinto and later found out that they explode. But it was a new car, so what the heck. When you're writing fiction, what's your first name? Hi, Maddie. She said, when, you, when you're writing fiction, how do you create character and how do you avoid creating the same old character? I think, that, I think that the way that I would answer that is, first of all, you start with the idea that for most of us, we think that we're, we're good guys. We think we're the good guys. We think we're on the side of angels. And so my idea is everybody has some part of their character uh, it's admirable. I'm sure that at one time or another, uh, Theodore Bundy helped an old lady across the street. I have a tendency to start uh, totally unjudgmental. I, and that's, that, that's part of the benefit of working story rather than plot. Uh, our lives develop naturally and our characters develop naturally over a period of time and they are influenced by a lot of different characteristics and the way that we look at other people is influenced too over a period of time as we get to know them. Uh, sometimes 
women that you didn't think were, you know, particularly good looking, you get to know them. The more you see them, the more you say, after a while you say, oh, uh, that woman is pretty. And then a year or two later you say, that woman is really beautiful, but I didn't see that at first. Or you say, some guy, well, he's just a guy, and uh, he's sort of just somebody else that happened to be at this party or in this dorm or whatever, and you get to talk to those people a little bit, the personality starts to come forward and you start to see the, the shadows and the depth of things. I've got a character in Mr. Mercedes who's, whose name is Holly Gibney, and I expected her to be a walk-on, okay? She's this 47-year-old woman who still lives with her aging mother, and uh, she's got psychological problems, and she never speaks above a, a mumble. In fact, she's introduced in the book as Holly the Mumbler. The first time that my main character meets her is at uh, a Holiday Inn restaurant where he thinks she orders his sneeze burger because she speaks so low, she's actually ordering a cheeseburger. So I thought she was a walk-on, I thought she was a flat character. Little by little, she's become more and more important to me and more fun to write about. And I started to see that she has an interior life. And you begin by observing. We, I mean, you have to look, you have to see. I mean, you can't just, walk and let it all go by. It's some of, it, some of it, this has got to stay. You've got to see how people are. Uh, you've got to look for the person who, uh, when they eat, uh, they have a tendency to look down at their plate and they're tearing their napkins. Have you ever seen a napkin ripper? Okay. Or somebody who's in a cafeteria and they've kind of like got the straw in pieces. Uh, Holly is a lipstick biter. You want to see them grow and they do their own thing if you let them, if you let them do their own thing. And one of the things that uh, drives me crazy about uh, second and third rate fiction is when a, a writer will wind a character up and make them go through certain paces. And I think, oh, why don't you just go back and cut out paper dolls? I, I've always remembered with affection the, the first line of Rebecca, where she says, last, last night, night I dreamt I, dreamt I went, went to Mandalay. To and uh, it's a story about the past, all Gothic stories, are stories about the past and how we hide secrets, the same way that I think that most stories about ghosts are really stories about bad conscience. They're things that come back to haunt us. There are certain politicians in Washington who could speak very well to that, <laughs> who have ghosts of their own. So I think that, I think that ghost stories really serve as moral tales, and so that's sort of what I've tried to tell. And the moral tale becomes me, what's the moral? I think the moral is you can't hide evil forever. Sooner or later, it always comes back to haunt you. <laughs> this is as contemporary as today's headlines, isn't it? Well, I like to think that it is, but <laughs> those are all things that the, that the book is. I hope what the book does is entertain. I tried to tell well, a good listen, story. I mean, if there's one thing you don't worry about is whether you can entertain. I mean, That's clearly... the first thing I worry about when it's me. <laughs> do you really? Yeah, I do. You uh, say to yourself, I don't care if it's, I mean, I, I'd like for it to be good. Mm -hmm. I'd like for it to be good, but mainly I want to make sure it entertains. But the first thing that a reader has a right to expect from a novel is to enjoy it, to be taken away to another place. Now, if you take a book like the Grapes of Wrath, for instance, by Steinbeck. You have a wonderful story of the Joads, and just incidentally, as you get into that story, maybe you start to discover some things about social issues, or maybe you start to see things from a point of view you wouldn't have seen them from otherwise. So I always think of that uh, TV commercial about Star Kiss Tuna that used to go, uh, we want uh, tunas that taste good, not tunas with good taste. Star Kiss wants tunas that taste good! When I write a book, a, a book like Bag of Bones, the first thing that I say is, let's tell a good story. And if my assumption is that if I like it, if it takes me away, if I can spend three hours and work on it a day, and I don't know where that time went, maybe the reader will like it too. But then at some point you're supposed to stand back and look at the whole thing and say, I spent a year of my life thumping away on this book in this little room. Why did I do that? What's it about? What interested me so much? 
you write books to find out how you feel about things. Don't you think that's no, true to a degree? You have, if you start out knowing and you end up knowing the same thing you started with, it's going to be a bad book, I think. Yeah, that's right. You've got to know more, a little bit more than when you started. You've got to have a different view of it. In the case of misery, what Paul Sheldon finds out is that, uh, that Annie Wilkes, in a way, is sort of expressing to him that what he's really good at is writing these bodice ripper romances and he better stick to what he's good at. <laughs> it's kind of sad, but there it is. There was no rationale. You go where the story leads you. And in this case, it had a, I didn't had no idea it was going to have a dark conclusion. You know, you were mentioning before we got going, Salem's Lot. And uh, when I started that story, I thought to myself, uh, well, this will be the opposite of Dracula, where the good guys win. In this, in this book, the good guys are going to lose, and everybody's going to become a vampire at the end of the book. And that didn't happen, because you go where the book leads you, and this one just led me into a very dark place. I didn't even want to go there. I want people to find it out for themselves. When I wrote The Shining, I said, I have this wonderful idea about this family in this haunted hotel, and what they really want is the boy with psychic powers. And at the end of the book, the hotel will kind of absorb him. And then we'll see the next year, we'll see the whole family as ghosts. But it didn't turn out that way. I, I feel like you have to follow the characters and you have to follow the story where it leads. And the last thing that I want to do is to spoil a book with plot. So you know, I think, I think the plot, that plot is the last resort of bad writers as a rule. I'm a lot more interested in character and situation. And you follow it where it goes. And, you know, I got a lot of letters after Cujo because the little boy died at the end. Tad, his name was Tad, and he died of heat, heat prostration in the car. And I got a lot of letters saying, how can you kill that little kid? So anyway, I had no idea that Tad was going to die, and I had no idea that uh, Danny and his mother were going to live, but I was really glad when they did. What advice do you have for young writers to become better writers, or maybe even novelists? Well, you have to write a lot. Uh, you have to write almost constantly, every day, and you have to read as much as you can. If there's one uh, fault or, or one thing that uh, I find disturbing about people who profess a desire to be writers of fiction is that uh, you'll hear them say, well, gee, I really don't have time to read. Well, that's crap. Everybody has time to read. Um, if you carry a book with you, then sooner or later, you probably will read it. Uh, and you might be doing that instead of watching Seinfeld on TV, but that might not be such a bad thing. I sound like I'm scolding you. I'm really not. What I'm saying is that I think that uh, practice makes perfect. And if you're going to be a writer, you have to write a lot. And you have to write a lot of fiction if you want to be a fiction writer. Thank you.